Hi, I'm Anjali Alapat, the host of ARCS, a series about literary inspiration. I have loved fantasy and sci-fi for as long as I can remember. In these strange times, these stories are a wonderful form of escape. Doorways to different worlds, offering glimpses into possible futures. In this first series, I'm going to be talking to six celebrated writers of speculative fiction from South Asia to find out what really made them want to tell stories. We're going to talk about books, TV shows, radio dramas, podcasts, and movies that shaped and influenced them as writers. Today, we talked to Lavanya Lakshmi Narayan award-winning author and games designer. Her work is interesting, layered, and tackles some really hard topics with ease. Lavinia's debut novel, Analog Virtual and Other Simulations of Your Future, netted her the Times of India Author Award and a Valley of Words Award in 2021. She was also a Locus Award finalist and made the long list for the British Science Fiction Association Awards. Her short fiction has been featured in anthologies like A Flash of Silver Green, Third Eye, and the Golan's Book of South Asian Science Fiction. We discussed the books that set her on her writing journey, the importance of literary representation, access to technology, and the extremes of productivity culture. Hi, Lavanya. Thank you for joining us today on Arx. Thank you so much, Anjali. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really grateful to you and the entire team behind Arx for having me on your show. To kind of start things off, could you tell us a little bit about your journey as a writer and how you got started? Gladly. It's a pretty long one. I always wanted to be a writer. I fell in love with stories when I was really young. All the adults in my family encouraged storytelling. So, you know, I had all these multiple sources of stories sort of flowing into me at any given point in my childhood. And I remember being tremendously thrilled when I happened to read my first words, you know, and that unlocked these doors to uh, an entire universe. When I was eight years old, I happened to have to write, you know, that first composition every kid writes in school, which is myself. And at that point, I wrote, when I grow up, I want to be an author. And, you know, that's a tiny little pipe dream that I had when I was eight. I stuck to writing stories of all kinds all through school. And I think around the time when I was maybe 10 to 12, I started discovering science fiction and fantasy and genre fiction. And when I read Tolkien for the first time, I decided this is the kind of stuff I want to write. So at 13 years old, I was the kid in school with the big fat notebook who was always sitting at the back of the class during lunch scribbling my magnum opus, which was this epic fantasy trilogy that I decided I had to write when I was 13. And, you know, I got pretty far, but obviously, you know, I was a 13 year old and <laughs> I didn't manage to finish it, but it stuck as a dream. I went to college and did literature and I was so intimidated by the types of writers I was reading that I suffered from massive writer's block for years. And then I wound up working in game design where I used to write narrative for game. And I think that helped me overcome, you know, the sense of intimidation of not being worthy because my work had to go out there week in, week out because we had players looking forward to it. And I think working in that sort of organized, creative, structured environment really helped me hone what it takes to tell a story not just to develop an idea, you know, coming up with ideas is easy, but working in a space where these ideas had to see reality helped me realize that there is a certain process to writing from beginning to end and to actually completing project. And I think that's everything that led me up to writing my first novel. I love that. You mentioned that you worked in game development and that really affected your storytelling. Could you tell us a little bit about how that affected your process? Absolutely. It had such a positive impact, like I was saying, on my ability to take a project to completion. Because what I've realized working in games is that it is easy to have ideas and the initial rush of being very excited about wanting to say something is very different from the sort of backbreaking work 
it takes to get that message across. Taught me a lot about the discipline involved and the structure involved in creating. A lot of people, myself included, See, have the sort of misguided notion that creativity is the spark that strikes you on a beautiful rainy day with a cup of tea. But I had to be creative on demand at my job. And I think I managed to take the best parts of that because it can also be very high pressure. But the sense that I need to inspire myself and I need to inspire my own stories, that I happened to learn and hone very keenly while I was working on games. And I think that's become a very vital part of how I write because I try to do something writing related every day. I don't always produce the best words. Sometimes I produce absolutely no words, but I block time on my day and say during this period, if, if I stare at a blank page for two hours and nothing appears, then I will read something to inspire myself. I will do research. I listen to music. But I will immerse myself in this space meant for creating and thinking and, you know, sort of ideating because I cannot rely on, I don't know, an errant breeze of inspiration to strike me. You mentioned Tolkien, which is a passion of mine, honestly. And is that the book that kind of got you started that really inspired your writing? Yes, it had the most profound impact on me. I'd read a lot of, you know, younger fantasy up until that point. I'd read, you know, young fantasy with mature themes like Narnia when I was much younger. But there was a point when I picked up Tolkien and I remember reading it at my grandparents' place, you know, sitting on one of their rocking chairs, this old edition of The Hobbit with the cover illustration by Alan Lee and everything. And I know memory is skewed and convenient, but I genuinely recall sitting there on a summer afternoon with the fan spinning and reading it practically in a single step and being completely immersed, completely blown away by this fantasy adventure tale of, you know, an insignificant, scared hobbit overcoming his own fears and his own reservations to step out of his home and go down the path outside his door and go off on an extraordinary adventure involving dwarves and goblins and dragons and a lot of danger. And I think reading that filled me with this complete sense of wonder. Not long after, I mean, of course, I had to read The Lord of the Rings, but I will never forget the sense of wonder created in me by The Hobbit. That's lovely. And I think there are a lot of themes in The Hobbit that kind of set the stage so beautifully for a lot of his storytelling, which becomes darker and more nuanced. And there's obviously a lot more backstory. But it's sometimes I feel a lot of people forget how wonderful The Hobbit is as a foundational book for that whole world that he built after that. Completely. I was revisiting it last night. And what really popped out to me was exactly what you've mentioned, right? Like there is so much foreshadowing of the major elements that come into play in The Lord of the Rings and also the Silmarillion and the extended histories of Middle Earth. But they're all there in tiny little nuggets in The Hobbit. Dangers are hinted at, dangers that play massive roles in the wider universe are briefly hinted at in The Hobbit. Artifacts that play a massive role like the One Ring which is the entire, it is the driving force behind the Lord of the Rings. I think reading The Hobbit, my first reading, my memory, I was of course drawn in and very taken by this adventure story. And then we hit this chapter called Riddles in the Dark, which is the fifth chapter in the book. And it's where Bilbo Baggins meets Gollum for the first time. And I felt, I think the, the energy of that book change in that moment. You know, that chapter is beautiful, it's dark, it's menacing. And of course, he balances those moments of darkness and lightness in The Hobbit quite a bit. But that chapter, for me, really embodies everything that is to come in The Lord of the Rings in terms of the high stakes world, the kind of terrors that the Fellowship is going to encounter when they embark upon their journey to destroy the One Ring. 
it's interesting that you picked that chapter because for me, actually, the most significant part of The Hobbit is the introduction of Gollum, which is actually in the scheme of the story, a very small thing. But the fact that Bilbo chooses to leave him alive, the fact that throughout the rest of the series, Gollum plays this kind of foil to what Bilbo and Sam and Frodo's journeys are as all ring bearers. And I think it's a very interesting introduction to a character who goes on to be very, very important. Yes. Oh, absolutely. While I was revisiting this last night, I noticed, you know, Tolkien's descriptions of Gollum, his lamp-like eyes, sort of creeping and crawling, paddling about in his little boat in that underground cavern. The kind of menace of their game of riddles that he and Bilbo play. And a lot of very significant things, like you said, that come back into the Lord of the Rings. Bilbo introduces himself and says, I'm Bilbo Baggins of the Shire. And that tiny little sentence goes on to influence such major events in the Lord of the Rings. Similar to Bilbo leaving him alive choosing to leave him alive when he could very well have, you know, killed him. And I think that also shows a lot of depth of character, but in a very subtle way, it's not spelt out for you as a reader. You aren't handheld through what that means of Bilbo's character, but you can infer it and take it for yourself. And I love that. What do you think the themes from The Hobbit that have really stayed with you? Because it is one of those books that I feel everybody has some kind of opinion on, especially now that there are, I think, five or six movies. <laughs> They're probably not five or six. I just like saying that because it's insane to me. Personally, making The Hobbit into three movies was a bit of a stretch, in my opinion. I think what really stands out to me in The Hobbit are, you know, the personal acts of courage that Bilbo, who is, you know, hobbits by nature, do not like adventures. Bilbo has a side to him. You know, historically, his family has a side that dares to go on some adventures sometimes. And when he unwittingly signs up for his adventure, he is very reluctant. You know, he constantly wishes for his hobbit hole all through the book, and yet he continues. He carries on. And that is beautiful to me when a character wants all their creature comforts and everything they know of the world that makes them happy to be a part of it, but also knows that they are part of this larger adventure, this larger calling, and they persevere. And more than anything, Bilbo being a hobbit, completely unremarkable, rising to the occasion, growing into himself. I think that journey is wonderful in The Hobbit. I think a couple of other themes that stand out for me are definitely, you know, the nature of greed, which I believe he critiques, or one can critique by reading The Hobbit. When you look at the Arkenstone and the kind of changes it produces in people in terms of the need to possess and the need to hoard, when you look at Lake Town and what humanity in Lake Town has become because of, I mean, general greed and inefficiency. I think those are very interesting. And again, point to a lot of themes that he brings into the Lord of the Rings at greater depth. And I think finally, you know, the pointless nature of war, because it ends with the battle of the five armies and there is just needless death all around. I think those are wonderful themes that stood out to me when I was reading it and continue to stand out to me even now. And I think greed is something that Tolkien kind of comes back to again and again, and especially, I think, with regard to the dwarves, because even when it talks about the mines of Moria and, uh, you know, how they kind of rouse the Balrog, it's because they dug too deep, and that's what he always comes back to. It's an interesting thing, because throughout the books, he goes back to the corruption and darkness, which the ring kind of hones in on. And a lot of that seems to me really to be about character and integrity and things like that, which are very philosophical in its own way and very ahead of its time. Yes, quite, quite ahead of its time, I think. And, you know, almost extremely idealistic, in fact, because I think 
in Tolkien's universe, this quest for power, because that's what the ring symbolizes, it's ultimate power. And I think it's the ultimate test of character to see who wants that kind of power, because you see this repeatedly as a theme through the Lord of the Rings. In The Hobbit, of course, Bilbo unwittingly picks up the ring, right? He just falls into its own journey and he's unaware of its power, but constantly characters are tested in The Lord of the Rings. Everyone from Gandalf to Aragorn and Galadriel, you've got this range of characters from different walks of life who are tested. And the test is, do you want ultimate power? Because power is a double-edged sword. And I think in Tolkien's universe, those who sort of walk away from unconquerable power are very heroic. But you know, I also really admire his stories of redemption in a way. Like, for example, Thorin, who craved the Arkansas so fiercely that he was ready to go to war and ready to like exile his own friends and family. But in the end, he did have regrets. He, even though he died, he died honorably. And I think the same could be said for Boromir, who fell to the, you know, the lure of the ring. And I found that actually very forgiving in a way for a series that didn't seem forgiving on the surface of it. Definitely. I think it's fantastic that you bring that up because, you know, I agree with you. So much of this universe between The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, specifically in The Lord of the Rings, points to the fact that people can change. No one is without hope. There is always the possibility of redemption. I like the fact that in a fantasy arena like this, there is so much scope for characters to change their minds, to become more than what they are. And I think Tolkien does that beautifully. Are there any more contemporary books that you feel have influenced you as well? Definitely. So one of the things I've been talking about, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, in very, very, I would say, glowing colors, really, because of the sense of wonder and the profound impact it had on me in my formative years. But having said that, you know, there are gaps in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and they are massive gaps, which nobody would have noticed back when they were written, you know, in the 30s onward, but that are very stark and apparent in the contemporary world. It's everything from, you know, the basic assumption that all characters are white, except for the orcs who we don't know. And, you know, he talks about the Haradrim who feel non-white and he does not do it in, I think, very generous or nice terms. So I think there are definitely undertones of some kind of, I would say, I think a lot of prejudices creeping in. It's easy to say product of its times, but genuinely the impact that has on you as a young reader is very noticeable. Um, there's also the fact that there are no women in The Hobbit. And in The Lord of the Rings, the women perform very basic or typical roles. You know, Galadriel feels extremely pure. Arwen, again, is a romantic interest. And Eowyn, of course, is very badass. But again, in the capacity of she is shown relative to Aragorn and relative to the men around her quite a bit. So these were very problematic gaps when I was reading the books, which I was not aware of reading those books. So all this to say, there were contemporary books that actually came and filled these gaps in my understanding of what fantasy worlds could be. And one of the most important ones to me was uh, Samit Basu's Game World trilogy, beginning with the Simakan prophecies. Indians could go on quests or people with Indian names. You know, it's not set in India, it's set in a secondary world but a lot of the characters have Indian names. People with Indian names can go on quests. They can be irreverent, they can be witty, they can be snarky, they can be flawed, evil, good. They can coexist with everything, you know, from centaurs to, uh, I guess, troll-like creatures. I mean, his universe is so inclusive of so many things that we see in fantasy, but it feels Indian. 
And when I read that, it changed my perspective of the possibilities of fantasy and science fiction for Indian readers and Indian writers. It's so interesting that you said Samit's work influenced you in that way, because I had a very similar reaction to reading that series in college, because I remember thinking, oh, he's really funny. He can be funny. And I had never read an Indian author who had my sense of humor, a kind of very nerdy, referential, irreverent sense of humor. And it was delightful. Absolutely. I mean, he is so satirical and so irreverent. And when I was reading some of you know, the other writers I'd read with that kind of sense of humor were Terry Pratchett and Owen Colfer. And I love those writers, but they are distinctly, you know, British writers. And reading an Indian representing the Indian context or the greater Indian context and so many tiny details that you only catch if you are from this place with that level of snark and that level of humor it blew my mind it said you know not just that fantasy can be funny because we have that with Pratchett we have it with science fiction with Douglas Adams it also said Indians have a space to be funny in this universe and you can be a part of it too And Indians have, you know, an equal say in going and saving the world. And we can build universes that are inspired by where we are from, which, as I said before, I've always, at least growing up reading primarily English writers or the occasional American writer, but growing up reading primarily English writers, you never get a sense of belonging you never see things that you can immediately relate to. And you always wonder if your words have worth. It's very different now, but I'm talking about, you know, the early 2000s and the late 90s. Now that we've covered two big influences for you, are there any themes in either of those books that you find yourself exploring in your own? I also enjoy the notion that little people can make a big difference. And you don't have to be extraordinary and you don't have to be special. You just have to have courage. And that's something I take away from Tolkien and try and work into some of my characters, not all of them, but some of them. I think with Summit's work, it's more than anything, the tone of his writing. He's writing characters on a you know, death-defying quest to save the world and uh, discover their origins and all of that. But it doesn't feel dark. It feels warm. It feels inviting. It feels like bad things are going to happen for sure, but there's no reason we can't laugh about them while they're happening, you know? And I think I do tend to use satire and be quite irreverent in some of my work. And I think that, and not just the capacity to do that, but the confidence to do that as an Indian writer began, I think, when I was reading Summit for the first time. So if we continue with this, we could fill another hour talking about The Hobbit and Summit's work. But I do want to talk about yours as well. And I'd like to give you the floor to do a short reading from your book. Thank you. I'd love to do that. So my book is called Analog Virtual and Other Simulations of Your Future. It's available wherever books are sold. The 10% Thief. Nobody notices anything because nothing has happened. Not yet, anyway. This is how all things begin. The electric shield thrums ominously. It cuts Apex City in two, striking across the crater that was once Bangalore. She lives on the wrong side of the Carnatic Meridian. They call her Nayaka, their champion. They pledge allegiance to her. They're her people, the analogs. When Belcor ignored the cholera epidemic, she stole Meditech from their laboratories. 
When Belcor stopped funding their water treatment, she began lifting hollow watches. She snatches hundreds each week. One solar powered battery purifies a thousand bottles of water. If raid bots break into her pod house, they'll find the 140 square foot space filled with paperbacks. Nothing of value, no link to her crimes. She's discreet. Dead drops, paper money, 41 safe capsules buried underground. I am invisible. The virtuals know her as the 10% thief. They have a price on her head. I'm going to make sure I'm worth it. She strolls towards the Meridian Gate. Pod houses form towering aisles. Their circular windows are eye sockets and fiberglass skulls. On their eastern walls, a well-known artist directs a crowd of analogues towards the completion of the mural. It reflects their past and celebrates their present. Children scurry to the Institute, a cluster of pod houses that lean in dangerously towards each other. It's architecturally unsound, but the children don't notice. A small playground made of scrap metal and junkyard finds is laid out before it. Trash can lids form the seats of swings. A slide is cobbled together from scavenged planks of wood. A solitary child sits on a merry-go-round made from the ancient remains of a satellite dish. Hawkers set up canvas tents along the path. They're selling homemade sunscreen and scraps of illegally produced Climatec fabric. A stab of guilt, she sourced that Climatec. They'll be arrested and sent to the vegetable farm. She nearly intervenes. They'll be put down, harvested. She steals herself. They've been instructed not to sell it this close to the Meridian. You can't save everyone. She chokes on a rolling cloud of dust and presses on. She passes a structure resembling a giant tin shed. It's made from the rusty shells of freight trains, painted in bright colors that will fade in the relentless sun. The salvaged doors of washing machines form its windows. Hundreds of analogs line up before the entrance to the Museum of Natural Hundreds of analogs line up before the entrance to the Museum of Analog History. Nayaka feels a twinge of pride. Over 700 analogs participated in its construction, and even more came forward to supply the artifacts that fill its cavernous halls. At the edge of the analog world, she places her palm over a hollow scanner. Her silicone gloves fit like second skin. Their tips bear a set of 3D printed fingerprints. She's about to impersonate an analog gardener. They volunteer. They trust me. An armed patrol drone scans her. The Carnatic Meridian sparks blue. A gap appears, electricity crackling on either side. She passes through the Meridian gate. The light dims abruptly. A wave of cool rushes over her. The Sunshield umbrella orbits Apex City. It protects the virtual side from ultraviolet radiation, providing climatic conditions optimized for human performance. Her people are exposed to heat waves and dust storms. 26 towers form rank into the heart of the city. Thousands of employees are ensconced in biomat and frosted glass spirals, absorbed in holotech experiences. She spies a game of hyperreality golf, no doubt a sizable business deal in progress. A block of pod houses shares a cellular phone. The arboretum curves on either side of her, all along the city's borders. Thousands of trees flower in desolation. Most analogs have no conception of a tree. She makes for the teleportals, virtuals edge away from her grubby, shabbily dressed person. The port bot's cyber arm vibrates in disgust when she produces paper money. She steps into a carbon fiber capsule. The 10% thief is molecularly reconstituted upon the estate of Sheila Prakash, a holotech mogul from the top 1% of society. Don't throw up. The side effects of teleportation include nausea, but she's also never seen so much open space before. She's scanned and approved by a patrol drive. Once she's equipped with the jetpack, a sap scanner, pruning shears, and InstaBlossom compounds, 
Her instructions are delayed to her. She reads them and smiles. Today, she has a bigger prize in mind. Thank you. Thank you, that was so gorgeous. I'd like to talk a little bit about Analog Virtual. And first off, it's set in Bangalore. Yes, <laughs> it felt like the right kind of story to set in Bangalore. It's futuristic, it's tech oriented. And I was drawing on my experience of having seen Bangalore evolved over the last 20 years from a sleepy small town to this massive startup technology hub. Analog Virtual is set in a future meritocracy, which is based on productivity. What inspired that in your storytelling? I think it was 10 years spent working in corporate spaces where I saw what was pretty much the cycle that I had been raised on repeating itself endlessly. So this cycle I'm talking about is one we're very familiar with. We grow up and we're told, you know, get good marks, study hard, you'll get into a good college. And once we're in university, we're told, you know, study hard, get good marks, you'll get a great job. Then you have this dream job and, you know, you're constantly under pressure to perform and to deliver. And again, we're told, work hard, work overtime, put in endless hours, sacrifice your health, sacrifice your time with your family, sacrifice your hobbies and interests, because then you will get massive bonuses. You'll get to buy that dream house, the bigger car. It's this perpetual capitalist corporate ladder with a singular definition of success. And that's what we are encouraged to pursue. We are told that that is what gives our lives worth and meaning. And I think sort of being on that treadmill for years on end, there was a moment where I stopped to take pause and thought, why? Why is this what makes us valuable as human beings? Is there no other definition of value than this so-called notion of merit? And when we look at the notion of merit and we start to unpack it, we realize that it's a total lie. It's a sham because there are people whom you see being overachievers and, you know, get ticking all those boxes on what constitutes success. But so many of them have had an easier start than so many others. There is so much privilege involved in enabling merit in the first place. And yet we prize it as the only meaningful definition of what makes somebody successful. And that thought started to eat away at me and really disturb me, which is when I decided I feel like writing about it. And in this world, tech is kind of the line in the sand between the haves and the have nots. So what made you choose that as the focal point of the short stories? I think I sort of took what I see in reality around me today and projected it to an extreme. Everybody looks at these massive statistics about India and smartphones and the proliferation of smartphones and technology. And you see that, yes, a lot of people are more connected and we do have more access overall, but the degrees of access are so skewed. What happened during the first two years of the pandemic with classes going online and thousands of kids being unable to access education because an entire family shares a smartphone or two. The internet is not a fundamental right. Of course, I wrote this book prior to the pandemic. I did not realize that these aspects would become reality the year in which the book was published. That was quite horrifying to me. But having observed this, you know, over years of actually living with a lot of technological privilege, and seeing the kind of opportunities tech privilege opened up for me, where several people did not have similar opportunities, made me really think that in the future, this could very well be the line in the sand. I think it's so interesting the way you frame that, especially in the short story which has featured Nina, who's the young analog girl who's been a adopted by very elite virtuals. And 
it's so interesting the process of also integration and showing that even though maybe you have access the availability of resources is very different depending on where you're actually coming from and what your background is what your values are it's a very interesting perspective on how marginalized communities would also approach the mainstream definitely i think you know access does not mean the end of discrimination there need to be reparations and a lot of positive action to make up for historical marginalization and discrimination and i think a lot of the time that level of support is not provided it's often viewed that oh well you know what everybody has a smartphone right so everybody can access everything but that's not reality and in nina's case she is adopted by elite virtual parents she has access to some technology but she needs to keep proving herself to get access to more helpful and nuanced technology even if her parents are supportive she's got a close group of friends who are supportive she's still viewed and treated as an outsider in wider circles and to pretend that this is not reality for most people without a certain set of privileges in the contemporary world is to really live in a little bubble there are some really strong themes of othering and misogyny and i think an emphasis on societal conformity in the book could you talk about that a little bit and why you chose to focus on those themes so strongly without being a prophet of doom i think the kinds of things that we are exposed to and the kinds of things we consume can often fall into the trap of being an echo chamber and that's because you know with the current algorithms that are out there we see what we want to see even new recommendations that come into us are based on our consumption history also keeping in mind that we live in a part of the world where we cannot be as outspoken as we would like to be where journalists are routinely jailed where comedians do not have genuine right to free speech i think there are a lot of real world pressures to conform on a societal level that kind of bled into this book through the form of something that was more technologically driven where thought policing happened on a truly algorithmically generated level where what you see is what you want we want you to see we being the power structure and you will like it and you will continue to see it because this reflects the set of values that we believe merit approval in our ideal vision of society all dystopias are actually utopias that you know a group of people disagree with and i didn't say that i think i'm forgetting who did but a dystopia is somebody's version of utopia there is also misogyny I think the misogyny in this book that I wanted to reflect was not just from the perspective of the male gaze there is misogyny that is reflected through the female gaze as well especially in corporate spaces it is not uncommon to see women genuinely have to struggle to make it in a very male dominated space take on i hesitate to call the male dominated traits because i don't believe in that gender dichotomy but they do tend to take on what has been conditioned into the male gaze and use it for their own because that's what they've needed to do to survive but then that is perpetuated by both men and women to new generations of people working in these spaces and i wanted to reflect that kind of misogyny in this book that's such an interesting opinion because i also noticed in for example the persona police which is one of the short stories and it explored the misogyny in a very interesting way because it it dealt with somebody who had become pregnant but wanted to stay pregnant in an old fashioned way she wanted to do the whole 9 months of being pregnant as opposed to using technologically advanced methodology to have a child 
And what I found the most fascinating were the biggest detractors that she had were women who were just like, she's setting us back by a hundred years. She's like ruining the progress we've made in the field, which is, I think an interesting reflection of what modern feminism also is. There's a lot of different camps and a lot of different ways of thought. Could you touch on that a little bit? Thank you for your kind words, firstly. I tend to agree with you in the sense that there are many extreme views on what being the right kind of feminist means. And in my opinion, and I consider myself a feminist, it to be a feminist is to respect people's choices across the gender spectrum and across the sexuality spectrum. It is to respect people's individual choices. It is to respect the way they want to live their lives. And in the case of the persona police, because women have worked so hard to shatter the glass ceiling, and one of the ways they've done it is using this technologically aided form of giving birth, these pods where babies, where fetuses are incubated. When she wants to have a natural birth, she upsets a ton of people. And like you said, most of them are women. And I think what is problematic to me is, what really upsets me the most is women attacking other women for the choices they want to make about their bodies, for the choices they want to make about whether it's, you know, to have kids or not have kids to adopt children or have, you know, your own children, whether it's to have abortions or, you know, carry your fetus all the way to birth. I think to me, we're all in this together. We have been sort of oppressed and subjugated. And when we fight among each other over our own bodies, that's not furthering any cause, you know, and I wanted to reflect that in that story. I want to sort of show the various shades of how women and their choices, especially when it comes to our bodies, become, it almost becomes like a matter of public debate. There's also very interesting and varied use of AI in this book. And it's portrayed at extremes. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the thought process you had while you were creating these AIs in the book? So... I wanted to create AIs that helpful for sure, because they can be a tremendously powerful tool, but I also wanted to make them insidious and sinister because they could also be used for those purposes, depending on uh, who's creating them, who's consuming them and what intent they're designed for. So I have various generations of AI through this book in various forms. I've got an insidious AI named Ophelia. I was drawn in by the idea of any kind of AI called Ophelia because that itself sounded quite sinister. Yeah, she's extremely creepy. So I have AIs across generations, beginning with, you know, the opinion homogenization, limitation and alignment unit, who is a physical AI, I mean, almost robotic and she controls your thoughts. So she's a thought policing AI and a very obviously thought policing AI. I've got little things that monitor productivity. So you've got chips embedded that monitor your physical productivity, your well being, your moods. And this is, of course, inspired by smartwatches. I wanted to take that to the next level. And instead of having an external device embedded to people so that it feels way more intrusive. And to sort of demonstrate the degree of technological reliance we are tending towards. I've got algorithms in my book, you know, constantly telling people what to watch and what to consume and what to listen to. And I've got a very dark AI named Numesis. And Mimesis is the meta-interactive mental and emotional sentient intelligence system. Again, embedded, accessible, internal to you. It's an instance of code that really primes you to be your highest performing level of self. Potentially helpful, sure, but really insidious because it has access to, you know, all your health data from your hormones and how they interact to the way your heart is functioning and it can manipulate all of your hormones. So it can manipulate your moods. It can really mess with you. And using that, 
it's only a question of manipulating hormones enough and then you've got a Pavlovian response to everything the AI wants you to do, which is kind of what I go into in that story a little bit. And of course, the book is peppered with a ton of technology that isn't so algorithmic in its nature, all to say we are becoming immensely dependent on technology, which can be helpful and has certainly made life easier. But we need to be mindful of who's creating what kind of technology and why we're consuming it and just keep an eye on it. Absolutely. And I think also there's a very interesting aspect of it is that it's all voluntary. All these people are kind of victims of invasive technology and thought policing are people who opted for it. That's because we opt for it all the time. I'm certainly speaking from personal experience. I remember how I wrote uh, the title story, in fact, Analog Virtual. It was very much based on real life. When I discovered apps like Swiggy and Dunzo and Nika, basically things that door delivered everything I might need to go to a grocery store for, I began using them like nobody's business. Now, this is back when I used to work in gaming. And so I was in this little bubble of nonstop working, trying to build things I was proud of, but also trying to be really productive, you know, following into that very same capitalist ladder that I was talking about earlier. And so I was ordering everything I could possibly order off an app or off my computer. And then I decided that I was a bit burnt out and I took a break from work. So I quit my job and I had this very bright idea to go to a grocery store and buy fresh vegetables. You know, I had this pleasant memory of doing it with my mom, my partner, and I thought, let's go do this for myself. And I walked into the store and I was tremendously disoriented because I hadn't been in a physical grocery store in ages. Uh, I was ordering off Big Basket. I knew on a weekly basis how many vegetables I consumed because the app had stored that information for me. So when I walked into the store and I felt completely disoriented by the aisles, by the options, by the sheer degree of choices in physical reality, not as little icons on my phone, it shocked me and it deeply upset me because I was not expecting to feel so overwhelmed by what is a very mundane and everyday experience. And that prompted me to write that story. In this book, there's a lot of distance created between ground reality and this more comfortable, and I'm going to use this word again, disconnected world that's created for the elite. And I think that's, it's never more evident than in the short story, The Bimoji Project. And that is simultaneously the most bizarre yet almost depressing one, in my opinion. Can you talk a bit about those extremes that were portrayed in the story? Oh, thank you. I actually had a lot of fun writing that story in a very dark way, of course, because it is dark humor. What I was trying to talk about in that story is this disconnect, because I find it exists quite a lot in little bubbles of privilege, especially in little bubbles of startup and tech privilege, where, you know, that people are genuinely caught between the demand to work long hours. And so that angle of capitalism really creates this broad disconnect from ground reality, where you really don't know what's happening in the news. But there's another aspect of it where it also becomes slightly convenient in the high pressure, high stress environment um, to completely remove yourself from what might be upsetting on the street right outside your office because it is a lot less stressful to turn a blind eye to things. It is way more convenient to exist in the little bubble and to consume whatever Netflix is throwing at you and to talk about things that are relevant to the little bubble. I was also fascinated by the underlying acknowledgement that revolutions and power systems are cyclical. The revolutionaries of today could be the oppressors of tomorrow. I think it comes back to how I personally view power. We were talking about Tolkien earlier and how he views power. And I think I share some of that viewpoint because 
I genuinely believe that all power, you know, including technology, but also political power can be a double-edged sword. The people who fight for a cause and who eventually overthrow the, their oppression will not be the same people who are there 100 years later. And you don't know how messages might get mixed, how they might get diluted, how they might evolve. No human being is 100% good or 100% evil. Okay, I can think of a few who are 100% evil, but without dropping names, most of us exist somewhere on that spectrum. And it's very contextual. And it's my belief that, you know, all power will be replaced by new forms of power, which could go either way. There's no guaranteeing that even the most righteous cause out there cannot devolve over a period of time. And I wanted to kind of bring that in. I think that was really beautifully put. Thank you. And I'd like to wrap up by asking you what you're working on currently and what's in store for us in 2022. Ooh, so I have a couple of short stories that are coming out in anthologies this year. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to announce those yet, but I will say, you know, watch, watch my Twitter, watch my Instagram, because I will be posting there when they're out. But very recently, I do have a short story out called Bergamo and Vetiva. It's in the anthology Someone in Time, published by Rebellion, edited by Jonathan Strahan. It's a time travel romance anthology. And my story is about a time traveler from a water scarce future who travels into the past, back to the Indus Valley civilization to figure out how they manage their water. And she carries secrets. The civilization has its own secrets. Choices will have to be made and they will likely be devastating. And that's what I'm going to say about that story. I'm also working on my next novel. It's about the future of food and food technologies set in the far future. It's the most fun I've had researching a project in ages because I get to read a ton of books about food, get to watch MasterChef and call it research. That all sounds amazing. And I can't believe I have to wait for a couple of years to read it. I'm sorry. (laughs) I will try and work as fast as I can. (laughs) Here I am trapping you in the capitalist cycle of productivity again. Yes, write faster, 10,000 words a day. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, thank you so much for joining us, Lavadia. This was such an interesting conversation and it's been absolutely amazing having you on us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And thank you for all your wonderful questions. I had such a great time talking to you about all of this stuff. You can follow Lavinia and learn more about her work on Twitter at Lavinia underscore LN. ARCS is a series of The Subverse, the podcast of Dark and Light, a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagines futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice, and culture. Follow us on social media at Dark and Light Zine or at darkenlight.com for episode details and show notes. <laughs>